Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Karina Lesser, the Artistic Director of Scripps Presents, and I'm delighted to have you join us for a conversation tonight with Valerie June and Glory Adam. Today's program is dedicated to the Scripps Class of 2021. It's a chance for us to honor your hard work, dedication, and accomplishments. We also want to give a special shout out to the Scripps Presents and Public Events student interns who are graduating this year. Olivia Silva, Neera Kravik, Corinne Michner, Chugo Akujuobi, and Claire Joseph. Congratulations to all of you. Scripps Presents seeks to complement the dynamic humanities curriculum at the college by bringing the most thoughtful and timely writers, artists, and scholars into conversation with our community. Our theme this year to help mark our fifth anniversary is the future. For us, it's an opportunity to consider what's next in the world of music, performance, activism, and as today's program will explore, literature. Which brings us to tonight's guests. Valerie June is a singer, songwriter, and multi-instrumentalist from Tennessee. She's been hailed by the New York Times as one of America's most intriguing, fully formed new talents. She has recorded two critically acclaimed best-selling solo albums and has also written songs for legendary artists such as Mavis Staples and the Blind Boys of Alabama. When she's not touring, June splits her time between Tennessee and New York. Her collection of poetry, Maps for the Modern World, was released last month. We're delighted that Glory Adam, the author of Well-Read Black Girl, will be joining her for a conversation. A few quick housekeeping notes. If you ordered a copy of Valerie's book, you'll be receiving it next week via our book partners at Skylight Books. Also, we'll be taking questions from the audience throughout the program. So please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and we'll do our best to get to it. To begin tonight's program, um, Valerie will, will be reading from Maps for the Modern World, and then Glory will join her for a conversation. Valerie June, I'm so very pleased to welcome you to the Scripps Presents virtual stage. Hello. Hello. Thanks for having me, Karina. I am going to read from my book, Maps for the Modern World a poem called Giving Back with Gratitude. And I wanted to read this poem first because I like to start my days and things that I'm going to do with the attitude of gratitude and from a place of gratitude because I think if you start with being thankful, then the door is just open to so many blessings to come into your life through that, that way, that mindset. So there is a little gardening goddess that I drew for the illustration of this poem. And here we go, giving back with gratitude. I came to bask in the sun, to see my mother smile, to dream, see manifested. But while I'm here and thus so far invested, I guess I'll roll up my sleeves and kneel down on my knees planting flowers and seeds, so earth will know that I have blessed it. I also like this poem and the idea of this poem because we all know that we're going to leave this planet. We all know we have to pass and we have to move into a transition of another form or some might call it die. But how do we want to leave the earth? Do we want to leave the earth more beautiful and more elevated? And do we have a responsibility in each and every moment to make that our life mission and our life purpose, to plant the flowers and the seeds so that the next generation will have a more beautiful earth to come to? So it's a question mark, the poem of giving back for gratitude is. The next poem I'm going to read is another little goddess that I love, and she's a quilting goddess. She sewed this beautiful quilt, and she's still working on it, but she's doing it with all her heart. And so in everything we do in life, I'm always thinking, is my heart in it, you know? And I'm always thinking also how the quilt of life is never finished and how it, there's still colors to be discovered each and every day. So she's shining her light and she's still working on the quilt. And the poem, Quilt of Light, goes this way. Quilt of Light. They are all so beautiful. I'm so happy we found each other. We are all rich in self. We found ourselves within the world that is. We stopped asking the world to be what it is not and started to appreciate what it has always been. 
It cradled us. It sheltered us. It gave ever so generously. Gave and gave quantumly, quantumly to unfold for all to see. Woven, winding, intertwined, twisted, tossed, yours is mine. Look inside, go to find, check again, dust of time. Echo spin, air to sing, buzz of bees, hums all things. Om and om, all and all, oeo, all things glow. Om and om, all and all, speckled, speckled, quilt to sew. I like the dance of the poem. I like the rhythm of the poem. I like hearing the word om um, because that's a very calming um, sound. And when you're in meditation, just having that word om um, flowing is very centering and creates stillness in your heart. I also like the idea that we look at each other with God light, with goddess light with that great respect for all living beings, with that great respect for all things. So when it starts and it says, they are all so beautiful. I am so happy we found each other. We are all rich in self. It's the idea that we all have this beautiful light and that we all can be stars, that we are always already stars, that we came to earth to shine and nothing should stop that from happening, that we should uplift each other in shining, and that there are enough resources for all living beings to have what they need, from food to clothes to fortune to prosperity. I really feel like the mindset of scarcity keeps us from pushing toward like this beautiful mindset of all having every basic need satisfied. So... Quilt of Life is sewing together these beautiful things, just simple things. And I'm going to be quiet now. <laughs> well, kind of. <laughs> that was wonderful. That was so beautiful. Thank you for opening with your incredible poems. I'm so honored to be here and talk to you about your book. Um, we were talking earlier that about how moving your words have been for me like it literally your book has been such a gift to myself in the morning when I start my day I'm listening to your voice and I'm listening to your words because in my mind you're reading the poems directly to me <laughs> um and I I think I have so many questions for you but I would love to start at the very very beginning to learn what inspired you to write this collection and where did, why did you just decide to land on the title Maps for the Modern World? Well, first off, Glory, I feel like I'm talking to the Oprah of books speaking to you. So thank you so much for speaking with me today and asking these questions. And I just love your work so much and how you do lift up so many authors and people. And um, when I think about Maps for the Modern World, it is a collection of poems that I never thought I would be holding in my hands. I never set out to write a book from the beginning. What happened was my father passed away, and it was about four years ago, and I always hear songs. And the way songs come to me is I hear a voice singing to me. I'll be working or washing dishes or folding clothes or sometimes even dreaming, and I'll hear a pretty voice singing me a song. But when he passed, I started to hear a speaking voice just reading me, me these pieces. And um, like, for example, I'll read you one that came right as he passed, and it's called For You. It says, there is a space. It has always been there for you for you. I tried friends, I tried poems, I tried songs, but none belong. There is a space for you. Where the lens was blurry, where the winds don't hurry, and though the world won't cease to turn, it has been such a heart aching thing to learn. It has been with salted, wilted tears that burn that there is a space for you. Can't be hidden like all things true. It's only a body and the spirit flew. But here in me, there will always be a space for you. And so I heard that when he left and 
this is the drawing where there is a door to the heart and the inner work of the person and they open this door and all of this light is coming out and they are like feeling like they lost a piece of themselves but um they also realize that it'll always be with them and so when I started writing these poems for about a year they just kept coming and I would wake up and write them down or write them as I was going to the next gig or whatever and I met up with a friend one day, um, Amanda Lucidon, who's a uh, an amazing photographer, and she had written a book on um, the life of Michelle Obama because she was her personal photographer. And she said, "What is music? How's it going?" And I was like, "Well, it's going pretty good. I guess I'm just kind of bored. I've been traveling the world for a decade and playing music, and and now I'm drawing and doing all kinds of other stuff." And she said, "Well, how's your writing?" And I said, well, I've written tons of poems. And she said, well, I'm gonna introduce you to my literary agent. And that was Rachel Vogel. And Rachel is actually the one who came up with the name Maps for the Modern World. So my team has been involved from the beginning. And it's just been really wonderful to have this collective mind create this piece. <laughs> I mean, it's so beautiful. The fact that, you know, all these different things inspired you from your team to the loss of your father. I recently lost my father as well. It's been about the same amount of time and uh, like five, five years for myself. And that is such a transformative an experience when that happens when you lose a loved one, especially a parent. And I do think that that changes how you start to look at the world and how that, that like yearning for that person that you love, it changes just like your whole perspective. And I actually was thinking so much about my family. I'm also a new mother. So I felt like a lot of your poems were speaking to me and helping me center myself. The one that comes to mind um, is how to climb a mountain. Um, I love, I, I, I mean, I found myself like a mantra. I was like repeating these words, you know, I'll read it really quick for the audience. I wake up and face my work which is always larger than me. Then I remember that my job is mostly in the doing and rarely in the outcome. It is through the doing that I can afford to trust each step ever moving toward my dream. And I just was like, okay, this is gonna inspire me. Like when I'm feeling exhausted from taking care of the newborn and I have like all these deadlines, I'm like every step I have to be present. I have to write, I have to reflect and I can't get too caught up in the granding note, the, like, everything being grand and final and perfect. It's about the process. Um, and I think so many artists, whether you're a poet or a songwriter or a, a visual artist, like all these steps are required to create the final product, but it's not about the final product. It's really about the, the process, you know? And then you capture the process so beautifully in every poem. And it made me think, because you do all these amazing things, like you draw, you, like you do so many amazing things. Were you always like this? Was this how you were as a child? Is this like a new development for you to try all these things and not be afraid of it? Like, how did that feel? For you? Do, do you know what I mean? Like, how did that feel creating this like new body of work? Did it feel natural or were you hesitant at first? Well, I'm glad that you read that poem, How to Climb a Mountain, because I really, really loved um Amanda Gorman and uh, The Hill We Climb. And I had written this poem, How to Climb a Mountain, years and years ago, and I just heard about her this year. But to me, that poem is our connection in a spirit sense. And I just love that vision of you taking those small steps and just having that poem be a mantra. And it really plays into the fact that for me, creativity, a goal of my life and a dream of my life is that I would be very fluid with my creativity and able to do anything I wish without having that little voice inside saying, no, you can't sing. No, you can't play the banjo. No, you'll never be a guitar player. No, you can't write a book. Are you kidding? Because that voice stops us. It stops us from just playing, from just being magical and being creative and just like, grabbing a pencil and seeing what comes out or d 
dipping our hands in a bucket of paint and just splattering it and seeing what comes, you know? And I think like when we lose that side of our imagination, then we aren't able to sculpt a new world. And we constantly have to be growing and being mindful of the world that we're creating. And I think that comes from like um, that that can be inspired by our creativity and it is, you know. Uh, if you aren't being creative yourself, then someone else is going to go for it and be creative. So that should inspire you to go for it and be creative. And I just think that creativity to me is like, I'm a little mini goddess and I'm just trying to be like the boss who's the real goddess. <laughs> And she's creating all the time, especially right now with Mother Nature and the gardens popping with flowers and all of it. So <laughs> I just want to be as um, as fluid as I can with my creativity. And I've always loved to draw. I've always loved to sing. Things that are challenges are like um, learning to play the instruments, which I'm still doing. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think that's why a poem like How to Climb a Mountain comes along because it's like, whoa, sometimes I look at someone like um, Hendrix and I'm like, why can't I play like that? Will I ever get to where Sister Rosetta Thorpe is? Ever? But then I tell myself, no, just play this one chord. Just write this one line. It only takes one line to start a poem, you know, one word. Yeah, I'm in agreement. It's like one word at a time, one sentence, you know, doing a little bit at a time. I am, I, I love like little doses of things because after a month, after a year, it becomes a big thing. And you have to just like be committed to the idea, whatever your creative practice is, and just keep going and be consistent. Because I, you know, I'm not a person who writes like 3000 words in one sitting, you know, I'll be really happy if I write 500 words, you know, but it's more about you thinking of creativity as a muscle and being like, you know, building the habits like that allow you to build your work and, and love the work you do. Like one thing that I find because I am a longtime fan, I've, I've, I love, love, love your music. And it was so beautiful to discover this work because again, I kept hearing it in your voice. Um, and I think that one thing that comes across very clearly is that you're very grounded. You have such a beautiful energy and it radiates. And whether we're on camera or watching you in person in concert, like you have this beautiful energy. And I'm really curious to learn how you nourish it and how you fill your own well so you can create so beautifully and be so vulnerable with your community. Wow. Well, that is what I would use the word practice. And you also use the word practice in World War, uh, Real Red Black Girl when you're describing reading. And I just loved how you sculpted reading as a practice. And I yeah. think that creativity can't flow for me if I don't have a practice of going outside and looking at clovers to find one that's for a leaf. And every once in a while I do, but I have that practice where it's like, I'm just going to stop on it. I have a lot of stuff to do and a whole lot of deadlines, but I'm going to give one minute to looking at clovers <laughs> or um, dancing, just putting on music and just getting down in the living room. In the living room, there is no furniture in the middle of the living room, so I can get down anytime I want to without problems. No matter where I stay, I always make sure that I have that space. And um, other things like um, just galleries and gardens, visiting gardens and also keeping plants around, lots and lots of plants all the time. And just feeding off of that, the meditations, the mantras, and a load of baths. The bathtub is my office. <laughs> it's so important to have those rituals, right? Because it, it makes you the person you are. And it is about, like, again, cultivating that sense of community with yourself before you, because I, I really do believe in being generous, like in, in order to be generous with others, you have to be generous with yourself and kind to yourself. Um, and another poem that I, I absolutely loved um, revolved about that like self-compassion was um, a life's work. I believe it's on page 58. I was like take, taking notes earlier. Um, and I, I just love the last line is, 
like the rings of an old growth tree, like the treasure of a life's work, like the rings of an old growth tree. And you you have been like reminding us to be open and to be think of our life as like a beautiful, beautiful tree that grows and can change and, and that needs love and nourishment, it needs watering, right? Um, what is your connection to nature and how does it inspire you when you're writing a song or writing a poem? Like, I love the fact that you mentioned going out and looking at that clover. Have you always been a person that finds inspiration in her surroundings and her environment? Oh, yes. I've, I've been raised like in Tennessee and grew up here between the edge of uh, three counties. And there were always like frogs and snakes and salamanders and coyotes and all kinds of stuff out there. And we're like in the country and um, it's between Memphis and Nashville. And I can go outside and just look up at the moon and talk to her and have a relationship with her and see every star. And when I'm in New York, which I also have my home there, and I just can't connect with nature the same way. So I fill the apartment with hundreds of plants. <laughs> it's crazy. And my partner waters them when I'm away, but I have to have nature around me. And it's starting to get to where the bedroom's looking like a jungle and spiders are crawling out. And I'm like, what's that in my hair? You know, um, because maybe plants don't need to be in the bedroom, but I have a plant problem. So, um, but yeah, I, I've always had that connection with nature and I've always felt like it was my teacher and it is constantly our guide and it's constantly telling us like if we will listen it has all the answers it is how we survive everything we're wearing everything we eat and we have to respect it and it'll teach us about the process of um dreaming and the art of dreaming I'm very curious about dreams. I'm curious about uh, the anatomy of a dream. How does a dream come true? How could a dream like Dr. King's come true? Because we're still pushing to see that dream true. And so when I look at like how long it takes a tree to grow, I'm like, well, I'm just gonna give myself some time. Um, the world, we give ourselves time, but we know we're gonna flower. We know we are with the intention and stay in the course and having that, um, that uh, repetitive uh, kind of we're not going to give up on beauty. That's what Mother Nature's like. She's going through her winters, but she still reaches around and connects and has spring again. So we're all the same way. <laughs> I, I'm glad you brought that up. I recently read something and I'm, I'm going to get it kind of wrong, but basically the monarch butterfly, when it does its, um, when it does its like great migration, it takes like this, the, the same butterfly doesn't come back, obviously, because, you know, butterflies live, what, two days or something, but it, the, the, uh, I don't know what you call a clan of butterflies, but the, the, the whole, it takes a generation for them to do this uh, migration, basically. It's like, it takes them so long to travel. And I just thought about that, like, you know, the changes that we have generation by generation, the things that we hope belong for for our families, they take a long time to actually happen. And we are living in such an instant culture. But if we look at nature, if we look at bears that hibernate in the winter and plants that bloom, and we look at like the seasons, we know that things take time and it allows us to be more present and slow down. And I really appreciate that reminder to like really look at nature for examples on how to live your best life because we, we aren't meant to be algorithms that move so quickly. It, it's like there is a beauty in slowing down and knowing the pace of your own self and the rhythm of yourself. Um, and you brought up the word dream and it made me think of another beautiful poem um, that you wrote to grieve an old dream. And I think that's another, like I, I imagine some graduates are um, new graduates. Congratulations, Scripps class of 2021. Yes! <laughs> you know, pick up this book. It will inspire you. It will give you the next steps you need to know. And I remember being a new grad and not knowing what to do. And I, ha I have a a very, I'm proud to say a very unconventional career, but I've been able to do so many different things because I took a risk. And I also grieved old dreams. Like there were things that I thought I would do in undergrad that I 
did not do. Like, I'm not a lawyer, but I took the LSAT, you know, but, but, you know, like there's things you have to grieve and say goodbye to and let go of expectations. Can you share, because I, I, again, I love this poem. Can you share the things that um, maybe you had to let go of in your own career and your own experience and what led you to write this beautiful poem? Well, I can totally share something like that in the way of my career as a musician. Um, as a black woman who does music that's not necessarily what people expect from the color of my skin, um, I've always felt like I've had to, um, I don't explain myself to the extent that many artists do, but I felt like I've been pushing in some way to just be me and just to be a butterfly and to just fly. And especially as a black woman in country or Americana or Roots, that is a lot of weight that gets projected onto you. And I don't want to be the lecturer or the scholar who's explaining why, I, why I'm country, why I sound like this. I just sound like this. You know, I was raised around a bunch of country folks. <laughs> and um, and so I had to grieve that side of myself that was like feeling that pressure to explain the, who I am. I am just who I am. And the time and energy that I spend explaining who I am takes away from the creative energy that I can spend just singing my heart out and playing guitar and writing poems. <laughs> So I grieve that side of everything that I do so that I can just shine, so that I can just move forward. And, um, and there have been other dreams that I've grieved, but I've also learned that in grieving a dream, you, you learn so many things from following that path. You never are on a wrong path. Like the L set, has that come in handy at all in any way in another form? <laughs> you know, no, you didn't become a lawyer, but some of that information got you here to where we're talking, you know. So, you don't, there are no wrong turns and there's no wrong way. And that's another part of the grieving process is realizing I had to take that leap. I have to go. I, my heart is telling me and I want to follow it. Make, you make such a great point because listening to your heart, because that I, a lot of people talk about self-care and you know self-acceptance, but I think it's so important to also have self-trust, to listen to your intuition and know that, you know, and be decisive because once you make decisions, whether it goes the way you want it to or not, like you've made that decision and you can move forward, you know, it really does open up something in your life to kind of be firm in your uh, in your thought process and in, in your decisions, because it, it leads your life to go, I think it, it leads your life to be more intentional and move the direction you want it to. Um, and I, I also want to, I have another question. I have so many questions for you, but I have another question in regard to that, because the, the way the book is curated and how you place everything, it, it did feel very intentional. Can you talk about how you package the book and how you decided to open with the, um, they're like vignettes, the essays in the beginning, before the poems. What was the, the thought process behind that? Well, I was very afraid to write those essays at the beginning because I felt like in some ways I was explaining what was about to happen. But the poems are so um, kind of abstract and kind of um, otherworldly and metaphysical in some way that a person can define them for themselves. So I found that now, after <laughs> writing the book, that some of my favorite parts are the essays. So I'm really glad that I did it. And it starts out with the sections. And the section, the first section is consciousness and awareness. And I said to myself, we have to put, I'm putting these poems at the start because I want the reader to first just go within and first connect with themselves and to realize that the power that they have inside, the power that gets taken all the time by little ads or different things, <laughs> like if we will allow it to get taken, you know, so I wanted to reconnect and place the charger back into the socket by tapping into the consciousness and awareness that you and I, we all already have. 
So those poems are dealing with it, and they're trying to bring um, the reader back to what I call a collective mind's eye, where through you going within yourself, you're able to connect with the world outside versus outside and trying to get inside. So once you're in there, you realize that it is a magical garden full of amazing, adventurous things that are waiting to explode. And that's when you reach this next section, which is called Journeys and Dreams. And you start to realize that, yeah, like each and every one of us, we have dreams. And we have gifts. And we have reasons why we are in these bodies and why we come. And I think Earth gets out of balance because sometimes we're not able to really believe fully in our gift or the world tells us society isn't made for dreamers. So the world will kind of steer us away from our dream. And we have to like have these kinds of uh, voices that tell us something simple like seed today, flower tomorrow. Okay, <laughs> just something simple like that. Need to hear something like the poem Light Switch, where it says, There are those who receive great blessings with a great ease and little visible labor. There are those who spend lifetimes working toward the glory that is reflected many cycles after the first seed is sown. There are those whose consciousness allows them to openly receive a gift from the elders who have done the mundane. It is always a calling forth of all directions, of every corner, of all fibers of existence. It is always in alignment with the beyond, with the bygone to the before, near the between, just to believe. It is always an openness, an allowance, an acceptance, like a light switch, and a day that seemed long, and a year after year, and a life, or two, or twelve, or twenty. Any measurement of time is equivalent to one and the same as your eye begins to awaken with any measurement of time it has taken to what has always been there in the making for you, for only you. Because once you start to realize that you're in this magical garden of dreams, it is like a light switch that you can begin to see all the beauty around that's always been there. And then we reach the section of Lamentations and Transformations, which you're going through this process of like knowing that everything in this garden is going to pass into a new form, I think. And so that's totally got to be in there, the transitions. But then you come back to Earth, and you're back in the body, and you're like, well, I'm not gone yet. What about Earth and other worlds? And so it's an exploration. It's like going through all of the universe, all of the galaxies, but from an inner eye. And last is mantras, meditations, and um, mindfulness. And that section is just landing right back at the start with consciousness and awareness. It's bringing all of that full circle. You've gone on this wonderful adventure and this magical self-exploration and you're landing right back with something simple like the last poem in the book which says, every time you step out the door, be ready to be of service. Giving is the name of the poem. And it's got a little lady and she's going outside but she has all these gifts in her hands. And that's how we are every day when we get ready to leave the house. What you gonna give to the world versus what does the world have to give you? <laughs> I mean, again, that keyword giving, generosity, being open, being open to the possibilities and be think, not thinking about popularity or likability. It's more about being authentic and true to your own self. And I'm so grateful that you've been able to like really bring that down into the poetry and also, you know, bring it into your life's work. Are any of these poems, and please tell me if, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm moving in the wrong direction, but are any of the poems like gonna find them with their way into songs or into be set to music? Well, there is only one that is a musical poem and um, it, it has a melody, and when I first wrote it, it didn't, but now it's just jumping off the page. And so it probably will become a song. It's called The Mind's Eye, 
and there's a little lady, little goddess sitting on a lotus leaf. And I'll just be doing stuff and I'll hear it singing to me. And it goes, I am meant to wander. I am meant to roam. I am meant to see the world but never leave my home. And then it goes into the rest of the poem. So I got to figure out how it all really flows. But it's a very playful song. And it's trying to happen. <laughs> that I love oh, that's I, I I will be the first one to download I love it absolutely that's that's it's just it's so great I mean I also would love to hear I don't um I read the books I don't know if there's an audio book did, did you also do do you have any plans to do an audio yes because I, I did. yeah yes I need I need to listen to it because I was kept thinking I was like kept thinking about your beautiful beautiful voice and I'm like I would love to hear her reading all of these poems in one sitting, so I have to download the audio book as well. Um, my next question really is about um, this present moment because there, in each of the sections, it's really about being introspective and thinking about how you give up, how you show up in the world and how what you give to others. What are your thoughts around, um, well, the personal being political and do you think that artists have a responsibility to create change through their storytelling? Um, my answer would be yes to you. I think that's what you're doing by encouraging that, but I would love to hear it in your own word, the world's words when it comes to like really giving and making a difference, whether it's you know, protesting or standing up for others. Like how, how should one do that, advocate for others? I love this question so much, and it comes up a lot in artist circles now, especially. Yeah. And um, the the my aunt was running for Congress around the time I was putting all of this together, and Donald Trump was elected into office, and we were in the middle of all of that while I was putting this together, and. On the musical side, every single interview I did was asking me about politics versus my music. And I was like, why does he get all the attention when I wrote an album? <laughs> I don't think he deserved all my attention. <laughs> and so I was mad at politics. And I was like talking to my aunt and I was like, my record is not political. Why do I always have to talk about politics and Trump with my record? And she said, Valerie, because everything is political. And I was like blown away by that when she said it. Because I look at the world through a magical lens and there's fairies everywhere and stardust all over everything. And how's that political, Aunt D? <laughs> But I started to understand what she was saying, that beauty is political. And for you to look at this world and to see the heaviness and the harshness and the cruelty and the injustices and the racism and the oppression every day, people are suffering and we suffer. You know, even if you are living a life of just total charm and what's happening in Israel isn't touching you, you rolling around in a rover and you ain't worried about nobody, you suffer. We suffer as human beings from the fact that others are not where we are and um, or in a in a safe space. And and so when I when I talked when I really sat with what she said and I just looked at it from the lens of my magical stardust fairy lens I was like yes it is political for me to wake up and look at the world a granddaughter and great granddaughter of enslaved people and say I am choosing joy I am choosing beauty I'm choosing magic I'm not telling the story that Zora Neale Hurston told in their eyes are watching God because she told that story <laughs> and what I'm telling you is the next phase of that that evolution and that generation of uh, migrating butterflies and the, it's very fluttering and it's very iridescent and it's colorless you know but how do we get there and so we get there through beauty we get there through choosing beauty we get there through understanding that joy and beauty and love are the greatest 
forms of polit political power and that we all have it every day in here. And that's why there's a poem in here saying a vote is just a check mark on a page. I'd rather be a thirsty heart rattling a cage. Give me water or feel and hear my rage. We are living in a rich blind age because we all have this power, but we look to DC and to our politicians to do these things that we can do at the farmer's market with the way we relate to a stranger or at the post office with the way we relate to a stranger. And so I love in your book how you say that in a lot of ways you were writing that it was a call to action to, for black women to really freely define their own narrative. And for me, I'm defining that narrative by not telling the story of what I hear of from, you know, Toni Morrison or from um, Zora Neale Hurston, who are some of my favorite writers. I'm, I'm looking for what's after that. What is the, um, what was that movie that happened? It was so beautiful and it was uh, Marvel and it was black, um, black folks and we were all- A Black Panther? Yes, that's what yes, I'm Wakanda. For. We're going to Wakanda. <laughs> Wakanda. I'm looking for that magic and I'm looking for that all across of humanity. So it's a rainbow of elevated religions, of cultures, colors, and we're just celebrating who we are. We're all fireflies creating this beautiful world. <laughs> yes, I mean, it's, it's so beautiful to just hear your philosophy. And I, 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 I am totally in step with your auntie, the auntie, is it auntie B? Yes. yes. <laughs> Because, it, because it's true, like beauty is political, reading is political, like all these things that people you might take for granted and might say that, you know, it's part of my daily routine, uh, how we show up in the world and what we represent and how we, you know, share our love and like, just uh, practice compassion for other, all of it. It's part of our, our ideology in a lot of ways. So I'm really proud of you for acknowledging that and, and putting that in the book, you know, whether it's you have to spell it out, you know, you, you don't necessarily say like, this is my, this is how I vote, but you share, you're just like your meaning, you share the, the thoughts behind the words. And um, I mean, and also there's one poem that stood out to me. Uh, I can't find the page number right now, but I believe it's like the, the slave is mine. Yeah, slave mom yeah. blues. Yes, like yeah, and I just thought about like even that engagement, like thinking about the blues and what that means, and how we can hold really heavy, painful things, but still lift ourselves up and continue towards the the joy and the beautiful futures that we want. Um, there's a beautiful book called Freedom Dreams that talks about that, and in the book, the the idea is like looking at so, so many of our you know, Martin Luther King, so many of the folks in the civil rights movement. Now, you know, folks can sometimes be disappointed because perhaps it wasn't the outcome that they wanted, but that's not the point, right? It's like they have made so many strides and the, the real, to really look back at the civil rights movement and look at the hope of those individuals and not be deterred by what is happening and how that connects to you. It's like, I feel like that same energy is there. It's like, don't be deterred by things that might pull you down or make you feel less than, focus on the joy, focus on yourself, focus on what you can give instead. And that is where the beauty lies. Um, so thank you for just sharing that with us and giving us that sense of hope. Thank you, you're welcome. And I, I really love the way you expressed it and explained it because it deals in the certain sections that are dealing with manifestation and if we are constantly in our mind repeating the weight of the past and the negativity and the news recycling that to us and stuff, then how do we use our creativity at all? How do we go into this adventurous imaginative realm and dream new dreams? We can't because it's all convoluted and, and twined and twisted, as I would say. <laughs> So. But that, that's that's just like how uh, Toni Morrison she she her the, her great quote is you know racism is a distraction it's meant to distract you from your own dreams your own livelihood your own greatness you know so it's just kind of like again go inward go think about your community what can you do like to, for the people right next to you you know um, 
I, I think that's so amazing. And it's a good reminder in any form, in any creative outlet, whether it's in a song or in a poem, to let people know. And I think artists have so much power in that because you can get the message across and it doesn't feel, um, you know, sometimes I feel like people feel like politicians can be a little bit condescending or they're talking down to you, you know, but when you hear it in the song or you see something beautiful that strikes you and gives you pause, it, it makes you, again, it like shifts your perspective of this is how I can show up. And this is what I'm learning from this person. Even if they're not intentionally teaching you or not, it's just like you get to thinking, interpreting and trying to figure out how it can live in your own world. Um, oh, that's another poem I love, Little Worlds. That was another really good one. I love Little Worlds. Uh, let me see, there was a line that I wrote down in my journal. Where is it? Oh, here. Again, especially being in the pandemic, everybody with their plants everywhere, their new gardens, be enchanted by the little worlds, a plant, a wall, a door, a shadow cast because it means there's light to help you soar. And I was just like, ah, oh, that's so, be present, see the little things, like watch the grass grow. That, that's where we get to more mindfulness and being, you know, our greatest selves. So thank, thank you for the little world that you're introducing us to. I, I also wanna just say, so folks watching, if you have a question, please use the Q&A box. We wanna hear from you. Uh, I, I have 10 more, a ton more questions too, but I just wanna make sure anyone watching, if they wanna chime in with the question, feel free to do so, we're here. Um, I guess my next question for you is really about the things that you like to read and are there any particular books that you felt like your essay or the poetry collection was in conversation with? Did you read anything to inspire you to help you get to this place where you could write? Wow, I read a lot of Daniel Ladinsky's translations of Hafiz and um, they were just so beautiful and they were spiritual, but they were also just moving in the way of they connected me to nature they connected me to love they connected me to joy and i just dog-eared the whole collection <laughs> so those were very inspiring things like um autobiography of a yogi by yogananda that was a very inspiring piece because he was talking about seeing the world astrally and when i say i see the world with iridescence I felt like I met a kindred spirit in him through reading the way he wrote about the astral world because I believe and I believe that everything has an iridescent glow, everything, all the trees and everywhere. And when you look at life that way, you can almost see it, you know, these little glistening lights around everything. And, um, and so that was a really beautiful book to read. Um, let me see what else. You know, I, in creating the book, I went and I read a lot of women's spiritual poetry. The Shambhala Collection has a ton of um, spirit, spiritual poets and even things like Rumi. They were very beautiful pieces and I was very moved by those. Of course, Shel Silverstein, huge fan. <laughs> And, um, and I think that as we get older, we have to keep childlike hearts. So I love being an adult, but having a playful lightness to me in the similar way that Shell did. And um, Rupi Kohar, I love her work as well. She's a huge inspiration and the same publisher. So when I called that forth in my mind's eye, <laughs> I was like, well, what would a publisher look like? And because there were many rejections and I said to myself one day I was on tour somewhere and I said you know what it would look like Andrews McMill that's what it would look like and about a month or two later I got a call and it was like hey Andrews McMill is interested in your book <laughs> and so I think that um she's super inspiring and you know um, Bell Hooks is super inspiring because she's able to connect spirituality with philosophy with the the color like my woman of color struggles and anything I'm going through she just soothes it and um, 
I love the way I was raised very strong Christian and I love the way she um, marries multiple philosophies from Buddhism and different things. She takes the love and the joy from each religion and she uses it as a force for her life and I like to do the same. <laughs> I don't think that there's many, many rules as long as you're being in your positivity and in your flow and lifting others up, you know. <laughs> You're on mute. <laughs> we, sorry. We have some wonderful questions from the community. And I'm just going to go backwards. If you, you, I think you can see it in your Q&A box. But I'm going to start with Jackie's question. You discuss beauty and joy as political. Do you feel like joy is a form of resistance and resilience? What are ways you seek joy in your daily life? My friend Sarah Walco, who's an amazing sculptor and artist, she and I were having a glass of wine a few weeks ago and we discussed, she said to me, do you think your work um, reflects your resistance? Because I don't really, with my work, speak about like anything having to do with the color of my skin and and you know the resistance i face as a woman of color against racism what i speak with my work is about love and about joy and connecting people to that because i know that this is just a shell and <laughs> and that you know when i'm connected to that that yes it is a form of resistance and that is the only real truth I know because I am not this body and I know I'm not. I love this body and I'm so grateful for it. All of the, the whole thing, every piece of it. And when I look at other people's bodies, I see gods and goddesses everywhere and I lift them that way. And, and so I think when you see the world that way, that's what I mean by seeing it with iridescence in, in an astral way, that is an act of resistance for sure. Absolutely. That is you bringing all your ancestors and every negative ones and positive ones and rewriting the story right here today. <laughs> I, I would agree with you. I feel like my, um, I feel very confident in my skin and who I am and I show up as my full self. And if you do not like it, if you do not want it, it's okay. It's not for you. And I, I like stick with that, but it took me a long time to feel that confident. And, you know, there were times where, in, you know, I, when I was younger that I definitely um, didn't recognize my resilience, didn't recognize what I needed to do as a black woman to move through certain spaces. And, um, but I think once you, I, you said it earlier, once you start to look inward and you become less concerned with, you know, people pleasing and what, how others view you, there's so much power in that. And you can move through the world without a, without an issue because you're like, I'm not, I'm not looking over there. I'm not comparing myself to anyone else. It's all here. Um, and so I definitely believe that the work that I do and what I try to practice is this level of joy and resistance and not um, letting not letting white supremacy or any kind of negativity like bring down my joy. It's like really important for me to really like love myself and love others in the same way. Um, There's another wonderful question around um, this idea of violence and nonviolence. Do you see violence and nonviolence at play in your work? I do see violence and nonviolence at play in my work and I look at nature and um, and the certain times when <laughs> I'll be watching a show like David Attenborough has a show right now on Netflix about life in color and it's all colorful animals and plants and nature. It's a nature show. And how like, you know, the cheetah goes after the deer and I'm just, my heart is pacing and pumping out of my body. I'm like, why? Why does it have to be violent? But, um, Nature does have that level to it, and I'm still trying to really like connect with all of that on the spiritual level with what that means to me. And so, it is a question mark in my work violence and nonviolence, they're question marks. They're like, is it 
you know, I'm all about love. I'm all about peace. And what does that mean? Like when someone's standing over you in the middle of the night and they have a gun to your head, like, do you fight for yourself? Yes. I feel like I, I'm torn. Like I'm all about nonviolence, but I'm also going to like reach for something to beat the hell out of them. So, you know, like I'm still struggling with that. And so that's really a question for me more than an answer. And so it's in the work. There are times where I'm in here saying stuff like, Oh, to fucking feeling, and I'm on my soapbox, and I'm yelling, you know, so that happens. Well, I'm so glad you said that, because I really do believe that, you know, your anger is tied to desire in so many ways, you know, when you, we sometimes negative emotions can be seen as something we want to suppress, but the reality is when you embrace them, and figure out like what is the deeper meaning behind the anger what is the deeper meaning behind the you know the root causes of the violence like what does that lead to because i mean clearly these things lead to movements and they lead for you changing like when you're frustrated and angry or disappointed you make a change in your life when you face a rejection you make a change so i i do recognize that like that kind of question of like what how does that play with it every day. But thank you. That was a great question. Thank you for asking that. There's there's two more. I know we're almost at time. Ooh. Um, I'll I'll just I'll read both of them very quickly. So um is there an album or artist that you're loving right now? If you can share that. And then the second question is a great way to close the program. Um, what advice do you have for people who are graduating this year and interested in pursuing the arts and writing? Oh. Well, the artist that I really, really love right now is Yoyoi Kasuma, and the reason why is because she is a magical woman, and she has an exhibit at the Botanic Gardens in the Bronx, and I was able to go and wander all through the beautiful garden I've been wanting to for years. I've been back and forth between Tennessee and New York for nine years and hadn't been till this year. And so I was able to go to my first out of quarantine, out of, uh, you know, I'm vaccinated. And so I went to see her work and I stood in front of one of the pieces and it just hit me and I just started crying because, you know, it was just dots. She just, and I thought about her spending her time doing that, the repetition of it. And that really became like the life's work. It really became like the the rings of the old growth tree. And she's an older woman now, but when she was younger, she faced so much as an artist trying to against, you know, as a woman trying to um, share her art with the world in the time of Andy Warhol and Jackson Pollock and different art male artists like that. And now that she's older, she's at a place where her work is world famous and being recognized, but she did have to fight for us. <laughs> and I respect her, and I'm so grateful to her for her work and her contribution. She's, her life is fascinating, too. She lives in a mental hospital in Japan, I believe, and, it's, and she loves it. She loves her life. She goes to work every day and creates these pieces that blow me away. <laughs> And, and the second part was around the advice for the writers um, that are graduating, or the artists, I should say. The, uh, the only advice I have is that it, you know, when we were speaking about, you know, that it takes one sentence mm -hmm. or one word to start, that you would just be free enough to start that one sentence and, and keep doing it, you know? Yeah. Keep like, you know, break out the canvas and just let it be on the wall. And every mm -hmm. time you walk by it, put something on it. And then three years later, you'll look up and it's a painting. Yeah. <laughs> like, wow, how did that happen? Right. <laughs> Would you like to close us out with a poem? Yes, I will. <laughs> I will. I'm going to end with the beginning. And it's a reminder for me and for all of us that of the light we have. And it's called You Are the Sun. It's the very first poem. 
This is the only place it is your perspective that must change. All planes exist here, all planes exist now. Same as in sadness as in joy exists now. Same as it is day here as a night somewhere somehow. So if you're looking for change, if you're searching for a place beyond, there must come a realization of you, you as the one. Meant for the greatest great, the sweetest sweet, the here and now, the right on time, the never late. If you're looking for a place beyond, you must realize that you, you are the sun. And your work, your greatest work is yet to come. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, Karina. This is so amazing. I, I have so many notes from your conversation today. And I love what you said about seeing the world with iridescence. And for this hour, and hopefully as we look ahead, I think you've given us that magic. It was just so incredible. So thank you. What a wonderful send off to our graduates. And um, what a joy to spend this time with you. Thank you for reading and for your conversation.